guys. Welcome to this episode of the Train of Feet. I'm Jai Delegere. With me on my co-hosts, Angel Sanchez. Yo. And David Bravo. What's up? How are we feeling today? Great. Ready for, uh, ready for this episode. All right, let's get the ball Roll it. So today, we're delighted to have on our second athlete uh, onto the show, and gentleman by the name of Tyson Kwiatkowski. He is a professional tennis player, Vietnamese-American born, and he's also part of the Rome family. That's how I've connected with this guy. So we're going to be able to ask him tons of stuff about being on the tour, about growing up playing the game, so on and so forth. So without further ado, let's bring him on. Tyson, what's up, man? How are you? Hey, guys. Hey, hey what's up? Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you too. Yeah, thanks for Quite jumping good. on. Um, I know you're part of the Rome family. I know you are a pro tennis player. So for those of us who may not be familiar with your journey, can you give us a bit of a uh, background on how you became a pro and, and the journey on, on, on your way there for us? Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me. Excited to you know help the Rome family out anyway. And I listened to a couple episodes of your podcast. It's really cool. Thanks, man. Appreciate Thank it. Thanks. But yeah, I mean, I, I've been a tennis player pretty much my whole life. I started playing um, because uh, both my parents worked and my, my grandma would pick me up from, you know, kindergarten and first grade. And she would play with her, you know, old women friends at the country club in the afternoons. And then after she was done with them, she would, you know, kind of toss me the ball as a five, six year old. And I just kind of fell in love with the sport. Um, for high school, I went to a basically a tennis boarding school uh, called the USTA and it was down in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. And then from there, I spent four years um, just kind of developing and uh, about half of us went to college and half of us went pro. Um, I decided to go to college because um, I had a wrist injury my senior year, so I wasn't quite ready to turn pro. Um, and, you know, it was definitely the best decision for me. I had, um, four great years at University of Virginia, had an awesome time there. Um, you know, ha played on an incredible team. We did some amazing things. And then you know, I turned pro uh, when I graduated in 2017. And uh, yeah, just kind of been on the tour ever since. Um, been a lot of ups and downs, but for the most part, enjoying it and still enjoying it. And, you know, hopefully it can keep going and see how far I can take it with my coach. So we're still, uh, we're still battling out there. So from what I've read, right, like I'm trying to believe what I've read on the internet. And when you won the NCAA Men's Single Championship, that's what enabled you to get the wild card to the main draw of the Open. Is that correct? Yeah, so that, that was a big, um, big push for me to, you know, turn pro. Obviously, with the U.S. Open, you know, comes, comes with a fairly large check. You know, it's like $60,000 for, you know, just for making the first round and, that was able to kind of, you know, finance my career for that first year. Um, you know, when you're playing these low level events with not a lot of prize money. So that, that was a really big deal for me. And, uh, you know, I had some decent success in that those first 18 months that just, uh, you know, kind of decided that, you know, this is what I wanted to do. And, you know, it's all, it's always the dream as a kid, you know, you want to, you want to be a professional tennis player and, um, yeah, I mean, I felt like I had to give it a, a fair shot. And, you know, for the most part, things have been going fairly well. So, you know, I'm grateful for that and really grateful for my coach who's been with me the whole way too. Uh, since, since, you got, since you became a pro, your coach has been with you? Yeah, so he was the assistant coach at, at Virginia. And then when, when I graduated, he left with me. And, you know, he's been coaching me and a few other different players in that time span the last uh, five years. So it's been a, it's been a good partnership. His name is Carlos Banatsky and um, yeah, it's, you know, we're, we're growing and we're learning from each other and, and trying to get to the top, you know? And you guys have to really get on with each other because it's so, I mean, it's mostly just you as a pair that go on tour. Right. right? Yeah. We, and we spend a lot of time together for sure. You have to get, yeah, you have to, you'll have to like each other to get along. Yeah. And I really want to, so you're probably familiar with the top, what well, were the top four, right? You guys were in the game. So Murray was a, has always been a big um, favorite of mine. And um, 
I've followed him for a number of years, but when I followed, I've been following the tour since probably like 20, 2008. And um, what is being on the tour? What are, or how can I ask, are there players that you've, are there more players or certain players you've been able to connect with, gain insight from some of those I may, just mentioned that have won slams, that have kind of been at the top, have been in the pros long enough? Like, is there anyone you, you get to, to hit with at the Open or the tournaments that you gain insight from that kind of give you advice? Um, I mean, obviously, I know the Americans the best. Um, you know, kind of one veteran on the tour who's probably my closest friend is Dennis Kudla. Um, mm-hmm. he's, he's been a pro since he was 17, you know, he's been top hundred for probably the past, you know, eight of the last 10 years. So I, you know, I learned a lot from him, but, um, one cool story is, you know, right when I, uh, played us open in 2017 with that wild card, like you, like you said, um, I got to practice with Murray and, uh, he's also my favorite of the big four. And so, yeah, you know, I'm was, so jealous was, right now. Sorry. That was, that was a really cool moment for me. And <laughs> he, he was really nice to me. And, you know, he could tell that, you know, I was, um, you know, nervous about my first slam and, you know, he basically just told me to kind of enjoy the moment and go out there and compete my butt off and realize that, you know, it's not going to be the last time I'll play a slam. So, um, that definitely helped me out big and it was just cool to, to spend, you know, three hours with him on court and, um yeah you know i've seen him around at tournaments uh in the past five years and you know he's always a very approachable guy um not that the other guys aren't i just don't don't know them personally and uh so yeah that that was you know big moment for me as a kid kind of just like after watching him on tv for so long to kind of be in the presence of him just hitting with him yeah don't screw up Start just trying to hit the ball back right when you're rallying like damn exactly <laughs> holding that racket tight <laughs> Uh, I wanted to ask some questions about uh, recovery and things of that sort of nature. So um, just starting out with what are some ways that you optimize recovery during a tournament, right? Because you're going to have to play several matches. Um, What are some ways that you go around that? Yeah, one of the things I think, like you said, that makes tennis really unique is that, uh, you know, it's not just one match. You know, you have to play, if you want to win the tournament, you got to play five matches in a week or six or seven if you're playing a Grand Slam. So it's, you know, you, you got to be at your best five times in seven days. So the, those recoveries, uh, you know, right in between the matches are so huge. So for me, it's, um, it's, it's really what separates the top from the, from the middle, I would say, in, in the game. Like, you know, you have Djokovic playing, uh, you know, you know, a two week slam and you see like guys when they get to the second week, they're, they're bruised and battered and already tired and they go up against Djokovic and it's it's not even a match because he's just so fit and he's also done it so many times. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is a huge challenge to kind of find a way to recover your best, but I mean, there are things that I do in my routines. Um, I travel with, you know, Norma tech sleeves for my legs to do that, you know, before and after every match. Um, you know, I ice bath depending on if it's available or if I really feel like I need it. I travel with um, some magnesium salts uh, to do a magnesium salt bath. I felt I feel like that has helped me, especially in the summertime when I'm sweating a lot and it's really humid and I really feel like I'm trying to avoid cramping and avoid losing, you know, salt and electrolytes and all that stuff. Um, you know, whether that's in my head or not, I don't know, but um, I also have a nutritionist and you know, we have a fairly optimized nutrition plan for, um, for, you know, you know, night before match and the morning of a match immediately following, you know, there, I like to take, uh, you know, beetroot juice right before I play. I feel like that's something that helps uh, extend my cardio as soon as I'm off the court. Um, you know, I've, I've gone through various different protein drinks but the the point is is that you know within 30 minutes um you know my coach hands me a protein drink and uh you know I like to joke that like you know win or lose what's always there for me is that that protein drink after the match so um that's kind of a joke I have with me and my coach um you know sleep is obviously huge everyone talks about sleep it's definitely what I struggle with the most especially when I'm anxious the night before a match I know that if I don't get like at least 
you know, eight and a half, nine hours of good sleep, um, I'll feel sluggish the next day. So, you know, that's kind of what I'm working on now with my routines and uh, just to try to optimize that for sure. Well, so that sort of leads into like another question that I have. Um, and I'll kind of say this before I ask the question. One of my clients was, um, he works for a company called Brain FM and he put me on to like how you can listen to some music or it's like, it's like sometimes it's music, sometimes it's just waves um, that uh, kind of like optimize your sleep or help prepare you to go to sleep. And he was telling me like, it might have benefits for you because you do, you know, personal training, whatever, whatever, and to help out clients as well. Um, so one of the things that I was going to say was that will, that might be one of the things that you experiment with, or some people might start experimenting with in the future. I know everybody looked at like Normatex sleeves for a while and they were like, oh, no way. And now all of a sudden, like everybody's starting to yeah. use them. Same thing with like the hyper, uh, like the, the Theragun and the hyper ice tools. Um, but anyway, so there's that. But then I also want to say like for coping with stress and anxiety, do you have any workarounds for that? before or during a match i know you spoke a little bit about the sleep and how that's very important but let's say you don't get that or like you're in between games and you're really you know tensions are rising anything that you can uh kind of throw at our listeners to kind of help with that yeah so probably midway through covid when everyone was at home i was just thinking about ways that i could use the time wisely i started working um you know over zoom with a uh, mental performance coach in a, in a program it's called piva p-i-i-v-a and uh, basically it's like a, it's a mental program for sure but it's based a lot around meditation um so i've been kind of you know doing that for the past just almost about a year year and a half now um you know there's a bunch of different exercises every day it's an app um that i see um, so I've been, I've been working at that at different types of meditation. I've been speaking with his name, the guy who's the founder, his name is Robert. Um, you know, a few techniques to help with the anxiety and then also some on court, on court techniques. Like when I'm, when you're really up and do it and you're in the thick of things, like what you can, you do 10 seconds in between a point to kind of bring the heart rate down, bring the focus back, um, things on the 90 second changeover. How can I? really get in refocus for this next point or if if you know something something happens where you know i i i lose my serve or you know i i choke a lead you know and, and i'm pissed off and i'm you know mad at the referee mad at my coach mad at myself just ways to bring it back to the baseline in order to do that so by no means and have i felt like you know that's like the end end game for me and that i've you know, successfully completed the program, but I do feel like it has helped me in those big moments to kind of uh, be able to bring the anxiety down, you know, just one or two notches. And, you know, that's what the the best guys do. I mean, in tennis, I feel like, like you said, like there's, there's sleep waves and Norma Tech, there's everyone's doing everything possible to like be at the top of their game, right? And it's just like very small edges all the time in, in any sport really, you know? Um, and it, it's just who's really clutch in those big moments. And I think that's what mental performance can really give you, you know, that, that one, that belief that you're going to go out there and be clutch in the big moment. And two, that you, you know, your heart rate, um, kind of stays low so that, you know, you can get blood to the brain and make the correct decision. You know, I thought it was amazing recently in the Super Bowl that, uh, they are not the Super Bowl, but. Patrick Mahomes, they, they had like a heart rate monitor on him. And in the biggest moments, his heart rate was actually like totally at a baseline when he's going for those, those game winning drives on the chiefs and that, that amazing, uh, that Bill's chiefs game, right. With a whoop. Chiefs I saw game. that. Yeah. yeah that his, his, heart rate, his heart rate didn't, didn't go up at all when he was doing those game winning drives. And I just think that like, that's totally insane. And I mean, I know that when I'm trying to close out a match, like, my heart is beating, my palms are sweaty, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about everything, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the people in the stands, the referee, I mean, there's so many, how many, how many dollars I might win, how many points I might get if I win my ranking, all these things. So, you know, yeah, I mean, the anxiety is huge. And um, I do think the mental performance side is something that uh, isn't talked as much about 
um, in tennis as it could be. You know, everyone says, you know, it's a very big mental part of the sport, but no one gives you actual practical solutions, right? There was one, I want to piggyback on that real quick. So you mentioned when you played at the Open, uh, I did I did a couple of years of working at the Open and catering. So I was around the tournament a lot. So one of those. And uh, one event we walked at was uh, Tracy Austin was a speaker. And mm-hmm. she won the Open when she was, what, 14? Something yeah, really ridiculous. So. She was yeah. a teenager or whatever. And then uh, when they asked about the mental aspect, she didn't really give a breakdown on, uh, like, I think her simple response to that was if I only have room for so many thoughts in my head, I only have room for positive ones. So, or if, if there are negative ones in my head, I don't have any room for positive ones. So that was, that was her response when, if she screwed up, hit the net or an unforced error, that was her uh, response to, all right, that's how I dealt with it. Like I just thought, all right, positive thoughts only. But as you know, it is just so hard to, to like, if you, if you are up, I don't know, if you had three set points to right. or, or even three match points and the person's tied up at juice and you're like oh like now i really have to make sure is when you start to spiral for me like if, mm. if something bad happens I'll, that's that's when i'll when i in the past where i've really lost it i'll start to spiral I'll be like you know f this i can't believe i choked these these set points you know i did this three months ago against this guy and i'm doing it again i didn't learn and I made the same mistake and, you know, then you, you know, every little inch you feel like starts going against you, you know, you miss a ball by an inch, your opponent hits a line, your the ref makes a bad call against you. Someone in the stand yells when you're about to serve. Like, I hate that. That's <laughs> such a dick move when they do that. <laughs> it's, <laughs> like, it's, like, it's a strategy. It's, like, it's, 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 that's, it, that's when you have to, really you know have the discipline to find a way to put a stop to those thoughts and those train of thoughts and that's that's what i'm working on right now for sure do you have a ritual for that stuff i mean because recently i've seen a video of this i'm not i'm not very big on on, on tennis and, and the names but there's one guy who just went lost it on one of the refs saw the video on this yeah. Yeah. Ref. Thing. so and bad it's like what what do you do in that moment like what what ritual do you have to not do that. I mean, it's, it's insane. Cause we've seen Serena lose it a couple of times and, you know, you have different views on that, but then this guy kind of just went at it at the ref and it was kind of uh, in was a crazy. really minor tournament too. Right. In doubles yeah. in a minor tournament. Right. Right. Yeah. For, first of all, it's wild that he did that in doubles, which, you know, in general, he doesn't really care about, but I know he was playing with his <laughs> friend. So he wanted to win for his friend. But you're right. Yeah. I mean, also it's wild that tennis only makes the news for a casual fan. <laughs> when, when somebody does something really dumb, like on, on, a, on a referee's foot. But yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh for me in those moments, uh, you know, I have like a, a quick breathing exercise that I try to do. Um, if if there's a, if it's a changeover, you know we'll do one where I close my eyes and I kind of just listen. And, and when you are in the process of listening and just trying to just focus solely on being aware of what you hear, you're, you don't, you know, you don't allow a lot of other thoughts to be there and it can quickly bring you back to the present. If you, you know, okay, here, I hear the, I hear the, you know, concession stand going behind the stadium. I hear the, the referee talking. I hear the, the fans walking in the stands. I hear, you know, someone chanting, you know, my opponent's name, you know, I hear the birds. If, you know, you know, a lot of times we were playing in empty stadiums the last two years, you know, I can hear the birds chirping and that'll, that'll kind of bring me back to the present. And then I can kind of refocus and say, okay, here, look, the score is five, four. If you told me before the match that, you know, we'd be on serve at five, four, um, I, I would be okay with it. And that's something I would say to myself after, you know, maybe losing my serve, serving at five, three for the set or something like that, you know, but uh, it, it's certainly much easier said than done. And it doesn't fully solve the problem, but, you know, like I said, you just really have to stop the spiral because the spiraling is, is what can, what can you make you lose control? I just wanted to uh, touch on one thing that you said, and Jacques, I'm going to steal one of your questions because uh, we're kind of touching on the subject. But um, right now we're seeing what we what we think might be like the endemic phase of this pandemic. Um, but uh, what Jacques wanted to say before I cut him off was, uh, ha- what are some of the challenges that the challenges that you've had 
while playing in the COVID era? And how did you um, overcome them? And how did you see others kind of, uh, you know, mimic the same thing? Yeah. Well, for me, the biggest challenge in COVID was, you know, obviously I'm, you know, my career high in tennis was 180. You know, I'm, I'm, I wasn't, you know, a top 50 player making millions of dollars. So, you know, for me, like, what was my motivation? You know, I really enjoyed playing in, in these, you know, smaller tournaments where, you know, you get big fans at these local tournaments and playing in front of people who actually like really care about tennis. Cause if you get someone who comes to, you know, a challenger level event or a low level ATV event, like these people in general, they really enjoy tennis and they, and it's fun to play for people in front of people that like are excited to come watch you play. Right. And, and for nine months we played in front of, you know, empty stadiums. Right. So the motivation there was, was tough because like you hit an unbelievable shot and you know it's silence right and uh you know on that on top of you know having to be tested you know five times a week you know tennis is still a very international sport so we're still traveling a lot and just the paperwork you have to do to fly the testing you know all that stuff it really was pretty draining the traveling um you know, that along with, you know, because there are no fans and that's the majority of our um, income in tennis. So our prize money was cut, you know, substantially. So, yeah, I mean, all those things made COVID tough and, you know, fingers crossed, like you said, that we're in the endemic stage of this. And, you know, for the most part, tennis is pretty much back to the way it is. We actually just got an email the other day saying if you are fully vaccinated with a booster shot or you had COVID in the last three months, you don't even need to be tested at these tournaments anymore, which is huge because um, there's still a fair amount of non-symptomatic positives being pulled out of tournaments. And, yeah. um, you know, that just can weigh on you. Like my friend, he made the semis of a fairly large tournament um, for us and he had no symptoms, tested positive, and you just get pulled out of the tournament, right? So, so you forfeit. Is that why they were? Yeah, you, you forfeit the tournament. And, oh. You know, when you, the big points in all these tournaments, they come in the later rounds, right? You lose second round, it's not, nothing really happens in your ranking. But big, big things happen when you win the tournament, you get to the finals, you get to the semis, et cetera. So that was a big loss opportunity for him. I would say it, it doesn't really compare to like, for instance, an NBA player testing positive and he gets pulled out of three regular season games, right? Not a huge deal, right? You, yeah. He still gets his salary, game salary. He's not missing out on much and his team loses him for three three games, which sucks, especially if it's your star. But, you know, you have you have backups for this, right? You have bench players. And, it, and it, as a pro tennis player, you know, you lose pretty much all the prize money you would have gotten had you been able to finish the tournament, right? You're on your own. And... Uh, you know, you miss out on a substantial opportunity to keep going in the tournament. So it's, it's a bit different in that sense. Obviously, you know, testing positive is never a good thing. You never want to have COVID, but that definitely does suck in tennis when it's just you. So I have a quick question. So the Australian Open was what, about a month ago when Adal won in the five sets, right? So what if, to my knowledge, all the players that went were, were vaccinated, but what if, that was my question. Do you know what would have happened if one of those guys tested positive in the finals? You just do because that's so, such a big money thing as well. Those guys. Yeah. So th that tournament specifically, and because we are towards the back end of the pandemic, they weren't testing players after you completed the initial quarantine. Oh, so uh, I, I think they had a like a three to four day quarantine. I didn't, I was, I just had wrist surgery. So I skipped the Australian open this year. So I, I didn't really fully read up on the procedures. And, and that's another thing that's been tough. It's like every tournament, every country has different procedures. Right. So, mm. but I do know for the Australian um, this year, they weren't testing after you completed your initial, like three negative tests and your three day isolation or whatever it was. I don't gotcha. know. Don't so no three days, but it was like once you completed those first tests, you were okay. You're in, yes. you're okay. Like so the US Open in 2020, um, we were all in a total bubble, right? But even and though no we fans, were, yeah, right. No fans, even though we were in a bubble, we were still being tested every two days. And there were people that even though they were in the bubble for because a bubble is never perfect, right? You have food work service workers coming in and out right. food, all that stuff. 
but you did have like one French player. He tested positive like before his first round and he had, we had all already been in the bubble for 12 days. So, you know, then he gets pulled out, which is a huge bummer for him because he flew all the way from France to play the U S open and now he can't play. So you couldn't even, could, would that put that, that guy, his only other out, but I guess it's too late to enter the doubles. I was thinking his only other way of playing in that point is entering same sex or, or mixed sex doubles. Right. But assuming the draw has already been done at that point. Yeah. Well, the draw has already been done at that point. And once you test positive, you go into immediate isolation for 10 days or that's, so that's like the whole draw. Point. Yeah. Like, oh, man, it's brutal. You're, you're just, you just, you're, you're shit out of, you're stuck out of luck, but you know. that's brutal. You curse, you curse by the way. Yeah. It's you totally can fine. drop all the F-bombs. Slit it all out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, I have a question how it's a, kind of a two-parter. Um, how has, your um your training been because of covid and how different is the training you're doing now compared to the training you've been doing back in school do you see any minor minor or major differences Uh, anything better or worse well to answer your first question i mean finally now even though you know i'm not technically on the court right now i'm recovering from an injury but for the most part i would say the training is getting back to about the same as it was pre-COVID. I'm, um, you know, gyms are pretty much fully open. The National Tennis Center in the U.S. is pretty much fully open again for us Americans to go down there. Um, you know, what, what was not the best uh, use of my time is that when the pandemic did hit in March, uh, we were all at a fairly big tournament in Indian Wells, the, you know, Indian Wells Master Series. And we, I flew home back to my home in Virginia and, you know, things just kept getting delayed six weeks, six weeks, six weeks. Mm-hmm. And I really legitimately thought that we were done for the year, right. When like maybe late April. So it came around. So I stopped working out for probably like six weeks, oh, like damn. lost all my muscle tone. I got <laughs> a little fat, like I was totally out of shape. And then like, like late May came around and there were rumors about, Hey, the U S open is going to happen in a bubble. And I was like, Oh shit. I got like, like eight weeks to get back in shape. And, uh, you know, my first match back was a five setter at U S open. And then in like late in the third set, I was like, not cramping, but I was like completely gassed, you know? So my first match back was a five setter. I lost in, four sets and because I, you know, my fitness just was, was terrible, unfortunately. And obviously hindsight 2020, I would have definitely used those four months to find a way to train, even though things were closed. And so I could have been more prepared for the end of the 2020 season. Um, But yeah, I mean, compared to college, like in college, you know, I was basically doing the bare minimum to be, uh, an elite tennis player just because you know you have classes you have social life all that stuff as well as you know I, my team was oh luckily I, we had a ridiculous team so I didn't have to be like the guy carrying the team all the time like there were times where yeah you know I you know I had to step up but it wasn't like every match you know I gotta be at the, my A game so luckily you know I was able to not do so much but you know, as a pro, it immediately changes and, you know, you, you don't have access to all the things you had in college for free as well. So you have to yeah, true. Basically create a team from scratch, um, you know, find an agent that can help you do that, find a consistent fitness uh, coach to make a fitness plan for you, find a tennis coach, uh, you know, nutritionist, dietitian, whatever, um, a mental coach, someone to schedule and, and, you know, basically kind of mentor you and give you advice on your scheduling because, you know, you make your schedule, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously you play the big tournaments and then otherwise, you know, you're kind of picking and choosing where you want to play. So all that stuff was a big learning curve as well as, you know, now that, you know, you don't have classes, you know, what am I doing on a nine to five day? Like, you know, now I, I wake up and I practice eight to 10 and then, you know, 10, 30 to, 12 we have lift and then I get lunch and then we go back on court just for an hour in the afternoon you know two to three and then 
three to four, I have mental performance. And then five to six, I have PT to work on my body. Right. And then, you know, and then I recover in the evening and, you know, that's, that's a normal training schedule, but, you know, it's putting that schedule together and finding the, the right people to, to help you out with that is, is the tough part. You know, honestly, the easy part is working hard because mm -hmm. every, everybody works hard. I mean, not every, yeah, there are instances where, yeah, you're just so talented. You don't need to work hard, but you know, I would say the easy <laughs> part is working hard, right? The, the tough part is, is figuring out the right way to work. Yeah. And then going out there and just being clutch. How are your lifts? I mean, uh, how is that scheduled? Do you have uh, weeks or cycles where you're lifting heavy, maybe before a big tournament and then you're tapering off? Or how, how does your coach program that? Yeah, we, or definitely, your, or your we definitely taper before uh, events. And the thing mm -hmm. about tennis is that our off season is so short. Like you, you know, Australian Open is in January and US Open is in September. And then there are a few tournaments in October, November, but really the season ends probably end of October and you have November, December as off season, but really all of December is preseason. So our off time to really be on vacation is like maybe 10 days long. And then wow. December is when we really put in that block, which, which I've learned after four years that you have to find some other blocks within the season. There are like little spurts where like, there's always tournaments going on, you know, big, small, but there are blocks of time that you need to take to get your fitness back, to recover so that you can go and play four events in a row. Right. So if you just constantly playing, you know, 40 tournaments in a year, that's your, your body's going to be brutal and you're Jesus. not going to be able to compete as well as you can. But I would say for the majority of the tour, you play between 25 and 30 events. So in those 25 and 30 events, you have, you know, 22 other weeks of the year that you need to, you know, put in little two, three week training blocks. And I would say three is probably the maximum, but um, yeah, that, that first 10 days will definitely lift a lot heavier. It depends on, on what I feel I need. Um, you know, I feel like right now um, in my tennis, I need to focus on being as explosive as possible. So, um, you know, it's a lot of first step movement, um, a lot of single leg stability stuff uh, when it comes to weight. So, um, you know, single leg squats, um, you know, single leg hip thrusts, things like that. Um, because in tennis, it's, it's a pretty imbalanced sport, I would say. Um, you know, my left quad is slightly bigger than my right quad because on your serve you land always on your left right so you toss you land you hit as a righty and you land on your left leg so your left leg is just in general more stable than your right leg yeah. even though i'm right leg dominant so you know i'm you know i do a lot of blood flow restriction on my right leg to try to get it to catch up to the left leg things like that and then you know right now since i have time i am trying to lift a little bit heavier so that i can uh, since I have that time to do that right now. Yeah. But, I'm uh, assuming they're also, you also have to have that like risk versus reward aspect in your head because you could, you know, there's so many exercises that are like you said about power and explosion that right. you could be doing, but you know, some of them are very technical and you don't want to get hurt, especially right, right. before a, I see yeah, that that's when you have to fully rely on your, your strength coach to make sure that, you know, one, they're giving you the right exercise and two, you're doing it correctly. What are you so, doing for your wrist? Um, well, I have a physical therapist here and right now I, I had a torn ECU tendon. So we had to go and get that, um, basically the, the bad parts of the tendon were cut out and then, um, unfortunately it wasn't arthroscopic. So I have a quite a big scar. So right now mm -hmm. we're just trying to get the mobility back in my wrist. You can see the scar here. Um, and then, you know, once the mobility is back, then we'll start strengthening strengthening throughout the whole arm because right now I'm basically just doing kind of shoulder prehab and, and light weights. So definitely I've lost a, a little fair bit of muscle in my right arm. And I know it'll, it'll be tough getting back, um, you know, getting the endurance back from my shoulder, just being able to be on court again for three, four hours at a time. I know that I've, the small things, like I've lost the calluses on my hand um, from holding the racket and, 
you know, that's going to take time to build back up and then there's going to be a fair amount of blisters coming back. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. The good one. Part of it. You know? <laughs> nice. Cause that's your playing hand. You said, right. Like, so yeah, yeah. that's the whole, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I want to tell you a funny story cause you probably know who this is. So this is back in 2015, I think. And I actually met, I did a me and green. I got to meet Murray and I was ecstatic, whatever, but it was that time of year when everyone was doing, so the, you probably know this as well, the week in, because the we're all, we're all based in New York city and the week prior, that's typically when everyone starts to come in, starts to hit. Well, so it's when the qualifiers happen as well mm-hmm. and they do some of their big events. And uh, I know Jez green. Uh, I bumped into him in the city and I was like, oh, you're just, and he just broke up with Welcome to Vanny Murray maybe in the last year or two. Yeah. And I wasn't long, I was a trainer for probably, probably. Oh, we'll say again. And now he was, he was with Zara for a little bit, right? Who we mentioned David in the rack instant. So this is his old training coach, right? Just to put the, everything piece together. So one thing I'll never forget with him was I asked him, because uh, I was recently becoming a trainer at that point, I'm not long with training. And I kind of asked, for like, where did you get your inspiration for Welcome to Murray or this? In no word of a lie, he says, I made it up. He says, I just, and what I mean by that is I think he didn't have one set blueprint. He just got creative for what he was working with him specifically. And he said, I pretty much what you just said, walking on single leg explosive power or single leg stability because it's so much pushing from one leg or the other. And I, I never even thought about what you just said about when you land on the serve, if you're right-handed, always landing on your left leg. I never even thought about that. I know yeah, everyone's... Those eccentrics in. Yeah. 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 And you said the BFR is what you do on the right leg, right? Mm-hmm. Love that. That's such a such a really effective way of training. I mean, that that's an amazing story with Jez. I mean, he's credited for as being one of the best fitness guys on tour. He basically created Zverev's body and Zverev is, you know, where he is because of him regardless of his racket smashing he's one of, say, one of the fittest athletes as well and and yeah i mean the the thing about tennis is you know there's just so many different body types and ways to be a successful tennis player like you look at djokovic and he's this uber, uber guy, flexible right? like strong but and stable but really skinny right and then you have nadal who's like an absolute tank, right? He's mm. back, he's ripped, you know, he probably outweighs Djokovic by 40 pounds, you know? Yeah, sounds about right. So, and then you have Fed, whose left arm is like a twig because he never mm. used it. And they asked him, like, why don't you even out your arms? He's like, well, I don't, I'm, I'm a tennis player. I don't need my left arm, right? Because he has a one-handed backhand. Yeah, so kind of exactly. So, so, so yeah, I mean, there's just so many different ways to do it. And I, I think the biggest focus right now is, is obviously you need to be explosive, you need to be strong, but all the all the up and coming new guys, their footwork is insane. Like they all hit huge, but they are able to hit huge because they put themselves in, in a perfect position every time to take a full swing at the ball, right? So the, the ball is in the perfect position and the game is moving so fast now. The balls are coming so fast that you have to move your feet incredibly fast and get in those positions so that you can unload on the ball, right? And you can send it back fast now. And I think the next generation guys way younger than me. I'm I'm just turned 27. I'm talking about guys like, you know, Carl Alcaraz, that yeah, kid. Yeah, Alcaraz, 18 through 22. Like their footwork is is what really stands out to me. But really, what what everyone talks about is, wow, he hits the ball so hard. But what allows him to hit the ball so hard? He's in unbelievable position every time. Are they also so, bigger, or are they or or not? Because yeah, everybody's doping. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. No, I mean, I, I just asked because uh, I, I forgot. I don't know if we've had this conversation here on the podcast, but uh, when it comes to like the NHL, when people would say that if Wayne Gretzky was to play right now, he would just get demolished by people just checking him. Yeah, I mean, I, I just feel like just sports in general, everyone now is, you know, doing, like I said, ticking every box, right? So when you tick every box, you're just going to be – a better athlete so yeah i mean yeah they, these guys are you know they're stronger they're faster they're bigger than yeah obviously than like you know the john mackinaw era for sure mm-hmm. um you know but then you also have all these new techniques that allow guys to play much later in their careers than than you have before like you know you have 
guys on tour right now in their late thirties that are still top 50. So that was never really a thing, you know, early in the nineties or early two thousand, right. You have guys being able to extend their career. I mean, Novak Djokovic and Nadal, they're late thirties now. Late thirties. Yeah. And they're still like not showing any signs of slowing down. Right. Like Nadal was especially on crutches five months before Australian open. And then he goes and wins it. That's wild. I also want to touch on uh That's sketchy, no? Uh... That's sketchy. <laughs> so he he ticked every box. I mean, is he ticking every box or is he <laughs> is he ticking uh, too? I mean, wasn't Djokovic at one point doing uh blood no, I think it was Djokovic was blood doping. When he you know in like twenty I wanna say this was like twenty What Lance did? No, this was Novak Djokovic in 2011, 2012 is when Novak started to really become like because for yeah because since, like, he went vegan. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Just completely love his shade, love it. <laughs> um, but was it so <laughs> when he he started to become so he was always in conversation with Djokovic and Federer. Uh, sorry, Djokovic was always in conversation with Nadal and Federer for like the late two thousands, but like. He won his what his first one in 2008, I think, Australia, and then started to be, but it wasn't until 2011 he was really starting to become more dominant, right? And then he right. was kind of, I, I would say, more in his peak and was the guy to beat, except for Murray had finished one year number one. I will give him that credit. But what I, where was I going with this? Um, damn, I don't know where I was going with this. Oh, yeah, I wanted to ask, it. go on, sorry, go on, <laughs> all doping. Damn. Um, oh, blood I'm doping, just, yeah, blood I just doping. Think the top of the sport is so unbelievable that like you know as as someone who can really understand that level it's just like the things that they do day in and day out with without ever like having a really bad day like from my level from you know 100 to 300 like everyone can play at the top level for a week right but then you have in 25 weeks a year when you play 25 tournaments you probably play good for five tournaments the other 20 and the other 15 you play okay and then five you play like absolute dog shit like they don't have five where they play like dog shit yeah they 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 have they get upsetted but it's because the other guy played out of his mind it's not because they just totally like just didn't show up that day you know like these guys they have it all down to a total science and every time they step on the court like they're 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 a force you know like it's, I'm watching, I watched my friend play Nadal last night and, you know, almost beat him. Right. Yeah. I mean, the second set was close, but the first set was six. Oh, Nadal six love. Right? Yeah. I bet and, on that. Whoops. And then, I mean, like it's, it's a different sport. And, and my friend is 35 in the world. He's a r- ridiculous player. You know, H- how do you beat him? Six. Oh, for a set. And then it's come back on. Totally and and second, was it second, three second, sets? Yeah. Second, set was seven, six. And, uh, Tommy should have won the second set for sure. He had a lot of chances and played really well, but you know it's so tough to take a set from those guys because the nerves you know, also be a factor, right? Yeah, I mean the mental battle of, like that. of wow, I'm about to take a set from a doll, even exactly. though you know, your level is there. Yeah, he's probably one of the hardest. So funny because when you uh, when I watch him play, I and mean, his his level is deteriorated, but I remember. I think his stats at the French Open or something where he's how many, how many matches has he lost there? Like maybe five or six. And this guy has has got more grand has he got more grand slam wins there than losses? Like as in how many matches he's lost? I think Who's at it? the French Open. No, Rafa Nadal. He has eleven what, eleven yeah. wins and only like yeah. six seven losses or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He has yeah eleven French Open titles and you know he's probably lost there like five times. That's just. The first it's, time he ever played it, he won it. Like that's disgusting. Eighteen year old, yeah. How does an eighteen year old come in and just and, and kind of what you were saying about when you have say twenty five tournaments a year and you expect to play well in you know in, in, in ten or five of them, okay, in fifteen of them, and right. crap in like five of them. Like how do you, how does an eighteen year old? You know what I wanted to jump into as well, asking. So you all know being the pro that there are some matches that last imagine it's six love six love whether it's you winning six love or losing that that could be over in 45 50 minutes or as you mentioned in your first match back was four sets but your first match at the open was five sets 
how do you, how does the nutrition timing go? I know you kind of touched about this earlier about like the protein shake and the beet juice, but how do you approach a match knowing it could be 45 minutes or it could be five hours? Like, how do you game plan for that? I mean, you just have to be consistent when you're on the court of how many things you're putting in your body to, to maintain that level. And, you know, before the match, you prepare like it's going to be a three hour match, no matter what, right? No matter what. Um, but on the court, I, I always travel with goose with, um, you know, they provide bananas and then I have, yeah, I mean, any, any little small sugar that you can get to kind of just get through the match and, and stay hydrated. Um, I like, uh, I need a ton of salt. I, I did like the salt test. I sweat a lot of salt. So, you know, Gator lights, there's this product called the right stuff. That's basically just salt, the saltiest, you know, drink of all time. It's got like, you know, 65% of your daily sodium. Um, but all those things can really help you push through and, and fight, uh, you know, heat related stress and, and can get you through those matches. But yeah, I mean, that's the sport. And that, that's why it's also amazing what those guys do because they go and they play, you know, a four hour match and the whole four hours they're engaged every point, right? No, sh no signs of, of um, deterioration or anything. And then they turn around they have one day off and they turn around and they do it again. So it's, it's a tough way of, that's possibly the only sport as well, where you don't know, you say you don't know how long it's going to be. Like if it's NFL, NHL, NBA, whatever this, you know, but yeah, that's, that's because I know, as you mentioned, if you have the salt or the free bananas, right. It's always good. Cause that's like the number, that's like the number one iconic food. I think I see most people consuming yeah. on court. I mean, it's tough. You you want to just be able to consume whatever's easy, you know, on your on your stomach and just easy to consume when you're sweating and hot and you don't really want to eat anything, right? Like I, everyone always says, yeah, bring a Cliff Bar. Like it's hard to eat those chunky ass Cliff Bars. Oh my know? god, yeah. I'll feel heavy after. Those are but, heavy. I mean, not even they're heavy. Like you have to chew hard, and then like there's just grains in your mouth, and you just, you know, you just. That's why I like the goose because I can just kind of just push them back swallow them and then be done with it you know easy consumption um, yeah yeah um i have one question i want to respect your time and not take up too much of it but i recently saw a video on why you know you need to have the perfect tennis ball for your serve and how you know when the tennis players are looking at which ball to use they would rather go for the ones with less fluff on it right yeah um can you explain a little bit of why that is or you know what how do you go about it yeah, so first of all, tennis, another wild thing about tennis is that almost every tournament has like a different ball, right? A different brand, a different, like there's a different ball for clay. There's a different ball for hard. There's a different ball for women. There's a different ball for men. Mm. Like, and, and you go and you can play like literally week to week, you're using a different ball. So it's tough. That's another thing you have to adjust to along with the conditions, the court speed, the surface, the weather, the altitude all those things. But, um, as far as actually when you're in the match, you want a ball that's not fluffy on your first serve, just so that aerodynamically it goes to the air faster and you can hit it bigger. So it's always an advantage to serve with new balls. So you change balls every nine games. So the person who gets to serve first, it's definitely an advantage, um, to serve with brand new balls, right? Because they're one, they're bouncier. So like when they hit the surface, they're going to explode off. And then they're also smaller because the more you use the ball, the more it fluffs up. Yeah. So that, that new ball is the fastest it's ever going to be. Wow. That's interesting. I've never, I mean, I've always seen whenever I do watch a tennis match, uh, they're looking for the balls, but from, in my eyes, they all look the same. Right. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, I usually take three balls and I pick the two of the three that are the best and, you know, put the, second best one in my pocket for my second serve and the best one I serve with. But, you know, then there are guys who egregiously take like all five or six balls in their hand and they're like staring at me. <laughs> and, they, and they go up to the ball boy. I know I won that one. Mate. It's like yeah. <laughs> throw, it, throw it to the upper side, up at the side of the court and have them like sprint. Over. It's wow. That's pretty interesting. Thank, thank you for clarifying that for me, at least that was something I, yeah, I wanted yeah. to ask. 
I get that. Uh, a couple times, so. Uh, but Tyson, we really want to uh, respect your time and we can't thank you enough for coming on. Uh, that was, that was awesome. We really appreciate it. Um, thank we, you. I'm sure we'd love to have you on again as well. And that was maybe fun, when, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, I said just that. That was a lot of fun. Thank you guys. Pleasure is ours. And maybe when you're, um, when you're back here, hopefully for the open, which will be what, like August, September, maybe yeah. we've opportunity to connect then and doing personal or something, but, uh, do really can't thank you enough. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, uh, if I'm in New York, we should uh, link up. And then at US Open, hopefully you guys can make it out. It'll be fun. Yeah. Maybe we get a training Good. session going or something, but uh, yeah. let's, and, an, and an interview. Let's do the two. Um, well, that'd be awesome. And dude, all the best of your wrist surgery, man. Surgeries suck. Yeah, uh, too luck. many. And yeah, uh, Jacques, had, Jacques had his, his own fair share of them. I don't have any cool, like, professional stories i'm just my body's just breaking sorry i've got the injuries and no cool story to go with it yeah i mean man (laughs) i I understand for sure you know how it is but dude we can't wait to see you on the court soon and thank you again brother thank you guys thank you thank you man you too great conversation i'm so pumped i'm so that was so interesting to get some insights from someone on the on the tour as well um that's pretty cool Definitely got some goosebumps when he said he hit Murray. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> small guy. <laughs> oh man, no, that was a blast. I'm um I'm loving this Rome connection too. These guys from Rome are some really great athletes coming on, and which makes me remember about they forget if you're listening to get 15% off on the Rome transactions, you hit the training feed or one word to get 15% off. Um, and did we um, get a chance to plug in Tyson's uh, Instagram or anything like that? Oh, I did forget that. I'm so sorry. So Kai's uh, Instagram, damn, I'm so sorry. Uh, if you, it's, uh, it's typically it's Ty, Ty Quiet. So spelled T-H-A-I-K-W-I-A-T. Sorry about that, guys. Cool. No, I just remembered. I was excited. It was a, it was a great episode, and you get caught up, and like obviously you were really excited too. I'm buzzing. Cool. He's talking about some tennis. I'm buzzing. Yeah. I know, man. <laughs> so, so yeah, more. just wanted to give a give a shout out for him. So those who want to follow him, learn more about him, check him out. That's his Instagram. Follow an athlete, yeah, and I think um, I would love to get to do. Uh, I mean, training him would be phenomenal, obviously, but I think also just getting to speak to him uh the week he'll again i assume everything goes well with his recovery he'll be here end of august and if we're able to do it i mean i doubt we'll be able to do it at the us open but whilst he's here in the city i think that'd be phenomenal um to pick his brain see how he's gone with recovery and hoping it as he mentioned it's we're more in the endemic stage because i can't imagine having to test every two days or and also as he mentioned if you if you lose your a day's or not even a day's what, but if you lose your potential earnings because you test positive, and you, even when he mentioned the guys in the bubble, mm-hmm. if you're in the bubble and you're doing everything you can, you're in quarantine, and you still get like you, there's nothing more you can do, and effect and your pay being affected by that is just tough. I think that's brutal. Sucks. So, yeah, and then yeah. also like the social stuff that you probably miss out on, right? Like a lot of guys talk about how um, when you're out and you're performing at the professional level you don't have time for like birthdays or christmas parties or whatever like there's a lot of things that you just kind of like push away but then you mix covid in with that and then the risk of getting covid will go up if you go out and do a lot of stuff so you're just trying to like either pick and choose like select things or like trying to keep it like tight knit like you only do like x amount of things so like i'm sure there's also a social aspect to it as well where they're used to being at least around people like maybe not drinking and partying but just being around people a lot more but now this is another level that they can't even do that in their off time so it's kind of a pain i think that's the case because i know in the i know the nba was the same the nhl if you were traveling on the road it was literally once you weren't playing practice and stay in the hotel room so excuse me i don't know if that's the case in tennis but i know when he mentioned the 2020 mid covid tournament there probably wasn't they probably weren't doing anything else but staying in the bubble like they weren't they thought and they probably have to wear masks all the time so but uh nonetheless great episode um and we'd love to have him back on in the future you guys got any closing thoughts before we wrap it up let's close it out let's wrap it up thanks for listening guys we're so excited that you're able to tune in with us so we appreciate that catch you in the next one Peace. Bye.